Before we get started with today's session, I'd like to inform everyone that we do have simultaneous translation available. Please check the bottom of your screen and click on the globe for interpretation services. You can select English or French, and this feature will allow you to hear the presentations in the language of your choice. Bon, avant de débuter la session aujourd'hui, j'aimerais vous informer que vous avez tous accès à la traduction simultanée. Veuillez vérifier le bas de votre écran et sélectionner le globe pour avoir accès à l'interprétation. Veuillez sélectionner l'anglais ou le français, English or French, puis cette fonction vous permettra d'entendre les présentations dans la langue de votre choix. So welcome back everybody to our fifth and our final day of the Asia Markets Forum. This week, we've had the opportunity to learn about key markets in Asia, namely Japan, South Korea, Vietnam, and Singapore. And I think we're beginning to understand why growing market demand makes for trade opportunities for Canadians. And in fact, in 2019, exports from this region, Atlantic Canada, soared to 1.25 billion dollars. Of that, $233 million worth of goods were destined for the four ASEAN markets that we are going to be hearing about today. Speaking of which, we are broadcasting live today with John Evans and Uday Panikar, both with Tractus Asia. We had the pleasure of welcoming Uday the other day, and he talked to us and he gave us market strategy insights about Singapore. John Evans is the Managing Director of Tractus Asia, and he's advised on more than $5 billion US in trade and investment transactions across a wide variety of sectors. And Uday has been Tractus's Singapore Country Manager since March 2018, and previous to that was based in India doing business advisory services from 2011 to 2015. So today, both John and Uday will be discussing with us about tapping into opportunities in Southeast Asia with the spotlight on those four countries, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, and Philippines, what we might call emerging ASEAN markets. And just a reminder, as in previous days, We'll always save time at the end of the presentations for Q&A with our speakers. And then I would ask you to type in your questions at any time they may come up using the chat feature. And we will try to answer all of those at the end of our sessions. So Uday, I'll pass the virtual mic over to you and we'll see you back after your presentations for our Q&A. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne, and uh, wonderful to be here again. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to, uh, to present our insights on, on these emerging markets. So I'll just uh, share my screen. And start off with Indonesia. So uh, before we get into that, um, just want to give a, a quick introduction to Tractus uh, for those who are joining us uh, new or fresh and haven't had the chance to join us for the uh, the webinars the previous days. Uh, so we're a uh, we're a management consulting firm that has been helping international businesses uh, and also government agencies with their uh, efforts in um, into making inroads into Asia, and uh, we have over 25 years of experience uh, in this business advisory role. Uh, where we have assisted uh, with over $8 billion worth of foreign direct investments uh, into uh, this part of the world. And uh, we have our own team across uh, 11 offices uh, in, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, China, India, and also representative in uh, the US and Japan. Um, and we are a, a, a team of, of 50, uh, our consultants and analysts uh, and country managers uh, based across these offices. So uh, we have a breadth of experience across various sectors uh, from our private sector side. And uh, we have a very strong economic development practice where we work with several Canadian provinces as well as North, other North American uh, states and, uh, and provinces and governments. So that's just a bit about us. I understand we have, uh, we're a bit, we'll be a bit short on time today, so might have to breeze through uh, some of the content here. 
uh, as we have John Evans, uh, our director, speaking on, on Thailand and the Philippines after this. So um, just to quickly take, take you through ASEAN and the concept of ASEAN. So the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, it's a collection of 10 markets uh, here in Southeast Asia, uh, mainly Singapore, Thailand, Philippines, Brunei, Cambodia, Malaysia, Vietnam, um, and Indonesia and Myanmar. Uh, so together they form a, a, a sizable economic block uh, and they're one of the top uh, top 10 uh, export markets for um, for Canada. Um, there's a population of about 650 million. So uh, a lot of um, uh, great target markets here for Canadian products. And um, there's uh, annual consumer spending of over $2 trillion. So um, there is considerable purchasing power here as well, depending on which market you're looking at. Uh, I'll be speaking about Indonesia first, which is that country at the bottom, several islands here at the bottom in case uh, you might not know. Um, so we'll be, we'll be focusing on that first, and then we'll look at, at Malaysia. So just going to the next slide, um, Indonesia is one of the fastest growing markets in ASEAN. It is also the biggest market in ASEAN with uh, the highest uh, number of people uh, in, um, uh, in, in this region. So compared to some of the other markets, say Singapore um, or, or Malaysia, uh, Indonesia is, um, I would say, further, further behind in terms of its uh, of its of its uh, life cycle um, and less developed, but uh, growing really really quickly. Uh, it has a population of almost 270 million people, so this is the most populous nation here, and it is actually a trillion dollar economy. So not a lot of people really talk about it, but uh, it's actually a trillion dollar economy, which is uh, which is a huge market, and um, in terms of GDP per capita, uh, we're looking at about. Um, Six thousand uh, dollars Canadian per person. It is a very youthful market, so a large part of the population is very young. Um, and uh, over the over the recent years, they have uh, significantly improved their ease of doing business ranking uh, with the World Bank. So, uh, gone from uh, rank number one hundred twenty eight to ninety one, based on various reforms that they have put in place over the past few years. They are one of the highest users of. Uh, or the most dense users of, uh, of internet um, uh, uh, services. So technology is uh, something that is, is quite um, uh, growing at a very fast pace. And that specific sector is, is something that Canadian companies can also look at. Um, but there are specific details about Indonesia that uh, everybody should be aware of, especially from a cultural standpoint. Um, it is a, uh, an Islamic nation. So you know, uh, halal comes into place when you're looking at specific products, especially um, agri-foods related products. It is, um, you know, language can be a barrier. So uh, the main language is Bahasa Indonesia. And, um, you know, it is uh, usually, um, a, it can be a challenge for some companies that are addressing the market firsthand and might need some assistance on that front. Some of the main industries in, uh, in Indonesia would be agriculture, food and beverage, textiles, um, automotive, electronics, and oil and gas. These are uh, some of their main um, uh, key uh, uh, areas of strength um, from from an exports perspective, and uh, it is also increasingly becoming a um, a manufacturing hub for various uh, international um, uh, mega corporations. So, uh, something that uh, Indonesia has improved upon recently, especially in the region where it is competing against uh, the likes of Singapore and Thailand and, and Malaysia. Uh, in terms of the pandemic, um, unfortunately, at the moment, Indonesia is still trying to contain its. Um, uh, the issues that the pandemic has caused. Uh, it has a high rate of, um, of cases. Um, so that has been something that the government has been trying to, uh, to alleviate and, um, and drive right, the right kind of campaigns to, uh, to make sure that people are uh, masking up and ensuring that they are following social distancing. Um, however, Indonesia is still open for business and um, it is uh, still continuing with its, uh, with its import and export uh, obligations. So uh, that has not uh, stopped um, uh, during this entire time. So it is, it is something that, um, you know, you can look forward to from an export perspective. Uh, we looked at a few of the, uh, the main export sectors of, of Atlantic Canada. So mainly seafood, ores, and mineral fuels. Um, 2019 saw, um, you know, Indonesia import, uh, a lot of this, uh, a lot of seafood and a lot of ores from, uh, from the world. Uh, but from Canada back in 2019, it was mainly seafood, which was the main, um, uh, the main growth area for them in terms of uh, bringing in Canadian products. So uh, it grew year on year uh, by 21% uh, in 2019. And 
uh, one of the challenges in Indonesia is getting good quality data. And as you can see, you know, for 2020, um, it's, uh, it's, been, uh, it's been tough to get that data. And that is something that businesses do face when they go to Indonesia as well. But um, just to track back a bit, 2020 has been, uh, I think, a tough year for everybody. And um, uh, definitely exports have been hit uh, from, uh, from Canada to, uh, to Indonesia. So uh, I wanted to take everybody through a checklist of, of uh, market entry tactics um, and, and, and what, what to think of both for Indonesia and Malaysia. And there'll be some similarities given uh, the similarities between the two countries culturally as well. Uh, but one of the first things to do is think about, um, you know, have you um, understood whether this really promising market um, is something that your product fits um, and whether you have thought about all the challenges that you might face there um, and also, you know, how promising is this market for you in the long term? So it is a, a, a critical idea to uh, look at market, uh, a market study, look at assessing the market for, your, for the opportunities in, in your specific sector in Indonesia, uh, understand if there's a product market fit, and also the competition that you might face in Indonesia, from both from local players as well as the others that are vying for the same piece of the pie. Uh, could be you know, Chinese, Chinese imports, could be Japanese, uh, and also reg other regional products that might be competing with you. Um, and of course, you know, looking at uh, whether the right way to enter the market is through a partner or whether it's okay for you to go alone. And that depends entirely on, you know, how much knowledge of the market you have already and whether you've done business there before. So that takes me to the next, the next part, which is, you know, uh, a continuation of that research part that I had explained just now. Um, regulations is going to be something that you would really need to dig into uh, when it comes to doing business in Indonesia. And it's a good idea to really get a proper understanding of this beforehand uh, before you embark on any kind of journey here. So imports into Indonesia come under the purview of the Directorate General of Customs and Excise. Um, Indonesia is not part of the CPTPP. So you will have to look at you know, your specific uh, products and you know, how much uh, import duty would be, would be there. But usually the average rate of import is about 7.5. Uh, and then there's an value added tax of about 10%. Um, Indonesia historically has had a protectionist attitude. Um, and when it comes to trade specifically, and, and this sometimes is reflected in, in their regulations. And, and um, uh, I would like to take seafood as, a, as, a, as an example. Um, seafood regulations are, are uh, they come under the purview of the, uh, the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries. And recently they have passed regulations um, specifically around, you know, whether Indonesia has local supplies or not for specific seafood products. So if they do, then you, know, you might face uh, challenges bringing in that specific kind of seafood uh, into Indonesia. So they, um, and then you know, there are other similar kind of regulations that might be there which um, kind of reflect that protectionist um, attitude. But otherwise, uh, you know, if, if there is um, a need for Indonesia to import say lobsters, then you know, that is something to check and, um, and then you know, go ahead with, um, with making your exports. There are other, other items that need to be, um, need to be addressed, you know, looking at certificate of origin, labeling in both Indonesian and Bahasa Indonesia and English. Um, and you, know, you might face uh, quarantine checks for um, imports and specific lab tests for, for seafood as well. Um, Indonesia being a, a, a predominantly Muslim nation, uh, halal is going to be something very important to look at. And uh, there might be the case that you might need to uh, look at halal certification all the way up your, uh, your value chain or, or supply chain. Um, you know, this could be ingredients regarding specific food items um, or other materials, raw materials that go into a product. So um, again, this ties back into the market research piece. You know, if you have this kind of information beforehand, you've done your homework, uh, then it makes it easier for you to address this, um, this particular item about halal certification. Um, Importers who are based in Indonesia, who will bring your product in, um, they need to make sure that you know they have the right kind of uh, business registration number, um, and also you know uh, this just makes it that much more important uh, to look for a partner uh, in Indonesia who can who can deliver the goods for you basically. So uh, you know one of the, the third item on on the checklist is wedding your partners. This is the traditional way to go into Indonesia. Um, it, it helps from a language perspective, from a cultural perspective, and also understanding the, the ambiguity uh, that is sometimes there in Indonesia's regulatory framework. So uh, we always um, advise our, our clients to you know, do your research in terms of who could be your 
um, your potential partner in Indonesia, vet them, interview them, uh, make sure you have a list of your critical items that, uh, that you need to uh, ensure that your partner in Indonesia has. Uh, this could be product knowledge, it could be you know, having a, a proper understanding of um, the regulatory framework in that space, in your product space, or uh, understanding you know, what kind of um, relationships are needed on the ground uh, regarding end clients. So someone who knows their way across, uh, across the country. So um, Indonesia is also a large country. So you might have to you know, look at uh, whether you want one partner who is there just looking at say the city of Jakarta, which is the capital or multiple partners that are covering uh, all the islands of Indonesia and all the big cities. So vetting your partner is gonna be critical. And finally, you know, just looking at how you might want to set up in, in, Indi in Indonesia if you're, if you're already there. The first thing is to make sure that you have, um, you know, uh, understanding what your options are. So one would be direct sales. If you have already been um, doing some business there, you have some relationships and your products are being used then, uh, and you're comfortable with the market, um, then you can, you know, set up your entity there, uh, doing the work on your own. Um, but if that has not been the case for you, and if you're if you're new, then the the best option is having channel partners who can um, who can take you uh, into the market and and uh, basically be your um, your eyes and ears on the ground and, and help you with sales there. And finally, you know you can you can always look at um, outsourcing your your specific um, service to um, to incubate uh, your company there. Uh, hiring people directly on the ground to just kickstart your process in Indonesia. So uh, that is another another um, choice, which would be just an in-country presence, and uh, that does depend on your on your ap risk for uh, appetite for risk. So uh, it depends on um, looking at uh, where you are in this in this path. These options depend on where on your path, uh, where on your journey you are for Indonesia. Uh, just some uh, a little bit on on culture between Indonesia and Canada. Um, you have, uh, you know, Indonesia is, um, uh, you know, just influenced uh, by, by Asian cultures, uh, various Asian cultures, and um, you see a lot of decision making, for example, being, um, you know, further higher up in, in, um, in companies, it'll be, you know, the seniors uh, or, the, or the, the top leadership making decisions. Um, individualism is, is, um, is, uh, is diametrically opposite to, to what we have in, in say, North America or, or Europe. And, um, Indonesians are also very comfortable with with uncertainty, um, so you know they they are. Um, uh, I would I would say it's it's uh, a country where it, there's more relaxed um, decision making. Things might not be as quickly done as you might expect, uh, but that is just part of the uh, the charm of the country. So in general, that is um, Indonesia. I would um, like to now go into Malaysia, um, another Muslim nation in the region much smaller in terms of population, and, uh, uh, but all, all very close by geographically. So just uh, jumping on to Malaysia. Malaysia is, I would say, the second most developed market in, in Southeast Asia or ASEAN uh, behind Singapore. And um, it is, um, you know, you had historically, there were the, the Asian tiger economies, which would be Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, um, and, and you know, uh, those countries developed really quickly, matured much faster. Uh, but Malaysia was uh, slightly behind. So it's called an Asian cub economy. Uh, it is still uh, far ahead in terms of its development, in terms of infrastructure uh, than say, um, you know, the Philippines or Vietnam uh, and even Indonesia. So it is, but it is one of the fast growing emerging markets here. Uh, it's an upper middle income market. It's uh, actually ranked quite high in the World Bank's ease of doing business ranking, uh, which is 12th. Um, and it is a, a, like I mentioned, it is a Muslim nation. So, um, you know, there'll be cultural uh, differences that you need to take care of when you are looking to do business here. Uh, it has been hit by the pandemic, like all the other, all the other countries, but it is expected to bounce back uh, by about 6% um, in, the next, uh, in the next year, uh, which is this year, so um, uh, in 2021. Uh, it is a, a destination of choice for various manufacturers in electronics, semiconductors, automotive engineering, as well as um, healthcare for specific um, uh, healthcare related equipment, medical equipment, especially things to do with rubber, as it is a one of the world's largest producers of rubber. Uh, so, uh, you know, things like uh, uh, medical gloves uh, and other related items is something that Malaysia is very, very well known for. It is also, and this is going to be very interesting for 
for a lot of the, uh, the Atlantic Canadian seafood businesses um, is that it's one of the largest consumers of seafood in, in all of Southeast Asia. So per, uh, you know, per capita consumption is about 60 kilos uh, per year. And uh, that is you know, combined with a culture of eating out um, and uh, the fact that they have a higher disposable income than um, most of the other countries in the region. So uh, it is a, um, uh, a you know, place to look for when it comes to seafood exports. Uh, Malaysia also very strong is also very strong in the petrochemical area. We you might know you might know the uh, the, the major Malaysian company Petronas, uh, which is one of the biggest players in the world, um, and um, also in logging uh, and palm oil. So those are the, some of their key um, uh, the key sectors. Uh, unfortunately, Malaysia is going through another rise in cases. In the middle, they had done well uh, handling uh, handling the pandemic. Uh, the rates of cases, but uh, it's just gone through another rise, um, and they've announced another lockdown. So um, uh, you know, business this has impacted business decisions, uh, and you know, everyone in Malaysia, um, several of our, our our contacts and relations, um, and those of our clients are working from home. So decision making has been impacted. So that is something to keep in mind. Um, and uh, you know, from a uh, from the standpoint of Atlantic Canada's top three sectors. Yeah, in 2019, you saw uh, mineral fuels being one of the top um, imports uh, into Malaysia from, from Canada. And uh, the previous year was, was hit um, uh, pretty, pretty hard by, uh, because of the pandemic. So going back into the, um, that same checklist, um, Malaysia is an up and coming economy, more developed than Indonesia, uh, a lot more, but that should not preclude you from uh, doing a, a proper assessment of your opportunities, um, depending on you know, your product and industry and uh, how much business you've already done there. So it is a good idea to look at um, what would be a, um, a good fit for your product uh, in terms of the market, that you understand what you need to do from a cultural perspective. Uh, would there be a lot of localization needed? Uh, so these are some of the items to think about. Um, Malaysia is also, you know, uh, known for some unforeseen bureaucratic or regulatory hurdles that that uh, keep popping up. It has also been going through uh, a bit of political turmoil, which uh, has impacted a lot of business decision making because people are uh, unsure what the next regulation, um, uh, regulatory updates or reforms are going to be, as they've just uh, undergone um, a few uh, changes in the government um, and their prime minister. So that has impacted um, international business. Um, uh, and, and business decision making. So, um, in terms of um, imports, the Malaysian Customs is um, basically oversees all the goods that come into the country. Um, average tariff rates are about six percent, but Malaysia is part of the CPTPP. Um, however, it hasn't ratified it yet. So, once that is done, then um, you will, you know, Canadian businesses will will benefit from the elimination of, of tariffs. Uh, in terms of um, uh, other taxes, there is a sales and service tax for every every product that comes in. So that this can range between five and ten percent, depending on on what your product is. Uh, so this kind of takes me back to the uh, the market assessment part that I mentioned. So you know this is information to to uh, research and understand beforehand. Uh, lobsters, for example, has a has a sales tax of ten percent, while uh, wood pulp and and paper products um, are fully exempt. So. Uh, it's a good idea to check you know, where you are in that, in that, uh, in that scale. Um, again, touching on the halal part, it is a, um, uh, you know, halal certification, uh, certification will be important for, uh, for agri-food related products um, and other items as well. Um, it is important to get that if you want to penetrate the market, um, given, given that the majority of the population in, in uh, Malaysia is, is Muslim, even though their, their society is made up of various different religions. Um, Islam is, is still the, um, uh, the majority. So halal will be important for, uh, for, for most products. Um, however, I should, I should let everybody know that, you know, if you're, um, if you get halal certification that is, uh, accepted by, um, or certified by, by the Malaysian authorities, then, uh, it's easier for you to actually sell that same product into Indonesia. So Malaysia's um, halal certification process is very well known within the Islamic market. So um, English is the main language in, in Malaysia, um, along with Bahasa Malay. Um, but you know you still will need to vet your partners, make sure that they are um, 
they are able to deliver on the promises made to you, whether they have the knowledge um, of that market that you are trying to, uh, to break into in Malaysia. But more importantly, Malaysia is, um, it can be slow when it comes to decision making. Um, and uh, it always helps to have a person there on the ground who can, who can help um, push certain decisions to be made. So some of the challenges that you can face there is, um, you know, if you're looking at partnering with certain uh, Malaysian local companies, there is a, uh, a regulation called the Bumi Putra Company, which is basically meant for um, uh, local, uh, to be owned by locals. Um, and, uh, you know, they come with specific uh, uh, regulations or, or, or rules that you need to follow if you're doing business with them, which can slow things down. Um, other challenges that, that some of our clients have faced or we have faced as well would be, you know, uh, communications being very slow. Um, or people, you know, not having the right experience um, to, you know, delivering on certain things. So vetting your partners will be very key. And uh, that's going to be, you know, done through your process of understanding what is important to you and then making sure that, uh, that whoever you're speaking with in Malaysia is um, uh, kind of meets those criteria. Uh, in terms of setting up there, similar to, to Indonesia, you can, you know, either go it alone and um, start your, you know, uh, pushing your product there, uh, making uh, making relationships and um, uh, making some sales, and then you know building it from there. Or traditionally, getting your you know partner who has a right relationships and can push uh, can push your product and promote that within the market, uh, can give you the guidance you need when it comes to regulations. And finally, you know, if you want, you can always um, uh, dive in first and uh, set up in Malaysia, uh, hire a local. Um, and then start building out from there. So that's uh, the basic market entry checklist that I've basically gone through for both Indonesia and Malaysia. And you'll hear that soon again from my director, John, as well. Um, it's, it's the basics, it's the important stuff. So, you know, are you ready to export? That's the first question. Have you done your research on the market? You know, does it really provide you the opportunities that uh, you're looking for? Is it lucrative enough for you in the long term? Um, do you understand the, the regulatory aspect? And then finally, you know, should you go in with a partner that you've vetted or you want to choose another, another option? Um, so that's basically it from my side. Uh, I, you know, from a cultural perspective, of course, um, similar to Indonesia, um, there is, you know, decision making is, is all the way at the, at the top of the chain. And, um, you know, it, is, it can be slow in, in, you know, in Malaysia because of that aspect. And, um, you know, there is a... Uh, they're more uh, leaning towards, Malaysians lean more towards a long-term kind of relationship and, and a long-term perspective when it comes to doing business with, uh, with anybody. So uh, something to think about. And yes, just some final, final few pieces. Um, you know, it's good to look at these markets to diversify, assess your opportunities, vet your partners, and uh, keep an eye out on, on what is actually going on in ASEAN during this time because things are changing very quickly. So I will uh, now leave it to John to cover Thailand and the Philippines. And then after, at the end of that, we can take all your questions. Thank you. John, the floor is yours. I'm, yeah, I'm here. I'm just trying to share my screen. Please let me know when it comes up. Yep, it's up. Okay, great. So um, welcome everyone. And uh, I'm delighted to be here today. I know that uh, you've, uh, you've had a busy week talking about, uh, about export opportunities into, uh, into Asia. And so um, one of the things that uh, I wanted to do today um, was, uh, you know, maybe take a little bit different tact um, because uh, if you've been listening to us speak this week, you've seen some of the same slides and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have the same slides, but I'm gonna talk about some other things. So today we're talking about ASEAN and ASEAN, the Association of uh, Southeast Asian Nations is, is 10 countries. And I think yesterday you, you heard uh, the other co-founder and my business partner, Dennis, talk about Vietnam. Which is one of the emerging markets, uh, you know, and, and a, a very exciting market. 
Uh, Uday uh, previously talked about uh, Singapore, the most you know sort of developed economy in, in the world in a lot of different uh, rankings. And then today uh, talking about Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, and as Uday said, arguably Malaysia is the, the second uh, most developed uh, country in the region, but quite a bit uh, still behind Singapore, and then Indonesia is an emerging country. Um, I've been tasked with talking with, with Thailand and the Philippines, and I'll get to those in a minute, but the, the other thing that we need to be thinking about from ASEAN is, is there are a number of other uh, countries, and I am, I'm going to sort of go in reverse development order. Um, Myanmar, uh, Laos are the least developed. Myanmar needs everything. And so there are trade opportunities in, in Myanmar as that economy comes back. Uh, it's as a, as a really just recently opened country, there's a lot of risk reward there. So pioneers that want to do business there, I can take advantage of it, but they can also uh, be burned. Uh, Laos and Cambodia, the next two uh, countries, uh, have lots and lots of Chinese influence. Uh, the, the Chinese have done a great job of inculcating themselves into the economies there. Uh, and that uh, can be both an opportunity and a challenge to compete there. Uh, and then the other country that we haven't really talked about, Brunei, is, is a, a, a small kingdom, uh, heavily reliant on its, uh, it, its oil reserves and um, very small population, but extremely wealthy. And that brings us to Thailand and the Philippines. And I have spent uh, most of my career here. I started in, uh, in Asia in 1992. And when I started consulting uh, in 1995, um, one of the things that was interesting is that I was spending time in both Thailand and the Philippines. And at that point, Thailand and the Philippines were really economically uh, equal and in terms of their development of uh, infrastructure equal. And one of the things that has happened is Thailand has developed much faster. And I'll talk now about Thailand um, and get into um, what is occurring uh, in Thailand here. Just give me a second. My screen is not responding to me. So just, I need to make one change. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about myself, of course, uh, in practice, because you've probably heard that multiple times. Um, what I am gonna do is I'm going to talk about uh, Thailand, the place that we started our business and you know, where I, I do call uh, home. Um, I also spent 12 years in, uh, in China in between my two stints here. So um, let me... I'm having some tough technical difficulties. So the first thing about Thailand, I, I think to, to think about is, is how has it endured COVID? And Thailand, if you look at the, uh, the graph there, Thailand for seven months had no COVID cases uh, other than a few people arriving in quarantine. Um, in the last uh, month uh, plus now since December, there was an outbreak at one of the nation's uh, largest seafood markets. And this is where seafood comes in from uh, local fishermen. Uh, and there were fishermen that were infected. And uh, what was interesting is immediately uh, COVID has had a, a second wave. And, you know, the initial wave was only about 2,500 people in, in total, and it was managed extremely well. We've now had about 15,000 cases in six weeks. Uh, and this graph makes it look like it's going crazy. But the reality is, is uh, after six weeks of, of lockdown, or I would say four and a half, it's back uh, under control and the numbers are going down now rapidly. And I think that's a great example of Thailand's public health care system and its technocrats uh, that make decisions. And they've done a reasonable good job of managing it, uh, which creates then economic opportunities. Thailand itself is a very balanced economy. Um, you know, if you look at this, you could say, well, it, it, it doesn't look that balanced because agriculture is uh, quite small. Um, the services side has been growing, but agriculture is a, is a main um, business here, both from a commodity standpoint and food processing. Uh, and the services are some of, of that component of that 58%, somewhere between 20 and 30%, depending on who you look at as tourism. Tourism has really been hit hard this year. Uh, as you could expect. 
And um, so that has brought the Thai economy down. Uh, it's brought overall wage rates down. Uh, it's, it's really depressed what has been a, uh, a pretty rapidly going economy. And until uh, we see the tourism rebound, uh, that's gonna continue to be the same. But what that's done is it's created uh, an environment where there's a little bit more competitiveness now. Um, Thailand has thought of itself as, as sort of the leading manufacturing uh, country in ASEAN. Uh, its wage rates were you know, getting uh, on par with Malaysia, although its, its productivity was, was a lot higher in a lot of sectors. Uh, and now, you know, that's coming down. Wage rates are not increasing as much, and there's a, there's some opportunities. Of course, uh, less of a uh, uh, less wages is com contributing to less consumer spending, uh, as people are are worried. And that particularly, as I said earlier, was impacted by tourism. Um, the uh, the forecast this year is to be about three percent growth. It's historically been at about five percent. Um, this year, of course, it, it was negative. It's a, it's a pretty easy place to do business. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the, of course, the Atlantic Canada's um, big exports being seafood, it is, a, it is a place that does a lot of seafood, both from the region and, and from around the world. And I think one of the things that a lot of people don't know about Thailand is Thailand, uh, you know, I think everyone, most people know it's a it's food hub as I mentioned, commodity, food processing, it's really a, you know, they, they have a saying here, it's the kitchen of the world. Um, and, you know, anyone who likes Thai food will, will sort of understand that. Um, but it also is a major, major exporter. But with those exports become, become imports for processing and a foodie culture that's been created now in the capital of Bangkok uh, that really could rival anywhere. There are as many Michelin restaurants now in Thailand, centered in Bangkok, as any any city in the world, if you can believe that, and there is a culture of buying high-end foods, whether that would be, you know, a, a Canadian beef or Canadian lobster, um, or Canadian other Canadian seafood, and uh, in pleasing the palate of uh, of that developing uh, food culture here. Um, here are some some examples of some of the. The imports and exports. I'm not going to go through them. I think the most important thing to take away from this is that exports were 249 billion, imports were 251 billion. So sort of a, a, a net balance. Um, again, another part of this balanced economy, uh, which is very strong. Uh, there was just under a billion dollars imported from Canada. Um, the, uh, the two things that are the highest, uh, gold, um, many people don't know, but uh, Thailand uh, is important for gold in, in two ways. One, it is a very large jewelry manufacturing hub. Uh, for uh, many years, it was the largest in the world, and then, uh, and then it was overtaken by, by India. Um, the other thing that it does with gold is that gold is a way to wear your wealth. And so um, when the economy is tough. People invest in gold uh, as a hedge for the economy. And then the, the, the wood fiber is really being driven by the paper industry here. That is, it, the manufacturing is, is quite strong. So if you look at the numbers from 2019 on exports from Canada, they aren't all that exciting. Uh, a lot of the numbers are in the red. A lot of them are down. Uh, mineral fuels went up and then seafoods went up a little bit. Um, I think some of these with a focus on Thailand, particularly now, uh, could rebound. Um, but the, the recent trade has, has certainly been negative from Canada to Thailand. So understanding market entry. Um, Uday's talked about assessing you know, the, the business case, assessing partners, um, vetting them. I'm not gonna get into that because that holds true in any market. Uh, but what you do need to really do is make sure that your product or technology, um, that there is an opportunity for it, and that it's, there's not a prohibitor, prohibit, prohibitive regular, regulatory regime or tax regime before you come in. You also need to make sure that you're looking at licensing and trademarking. Uh, and those are, you know, those are some of the things that you need to uh, carefully look at after you've determined if your product or technology is the fit. Um, the regulatory environment is pretty straightforward. 
uh, there, it can be nav navigated reg relatively easily, except for the language um, difficulties. And the technocrats that run most of the uh, most of the ministries are pretty good to deal with. Um, you know, the one exception historically has been customs, where uh, there has, of course, been some corruption, uh, but that has actually changed quite a bit, and um, that's getting better and better. And uh, more things are going online; they're becoming automated, and that is decreasing that uh, that corruption. Um, the corruption historically in Thailand um, is created from how the, uh, the economy and the, the politics are structured. As a constitutional monarchy, it's really, in my opinion, the, in my opinion, the last modern feudal system of any size. So it's a large functioning economy that works in a feudal system. Um, and it has been successful at doing that forever. And part of the way a feudal system works, as many of you would know, is patronage. And that's really where that concept of uh, what we may in the West call corruption came, uh, where here patronage uh, and royalties go both directions. The royalties go up, the patronage goes down, and things get paid off. And so that culture is changing. But what they have done is they've institutionalized it, much like the West, where um, there are fees that are now uh, not considered corruption. Uh, and so, uh, like I said, it's a relative, it can be a relatively easy place to deal with. Um, language barriers are certainly here. Uh, on the other side, there is a large um, expatriate community uh, in, uh, from the Western side, um, Canadians, uh, Americans, Europeans, uh, there are plenty of Thais that speak English well, particularly in Bangkok. And so while it's a documentation barrier, it can be quite easy to navigate uh, through hiring the right people. Um, one of the things that's, that is really important to know is there are restrictions on Foreign Business Act businesses, and that's done through the Foreign Business Act. And while it, it looks very onerous when you first read it, uh, and it curtails investors owning um, more than 50% in uh, a number of industrial sectors, uh, there are also ways to get around it by um, applying for Board of Investment Promotion um, and being able to um, utilize uh, some other structures here that, uh, that are accepted. And that's really if you were thinking about making an investment, um, but it's important because when you're selling into the country, there are things that are pre precluded from selling. Uh, I've listed some of these here. Uh, and then there's a second list, um, which you, can, uh, in, you can't engage in because of whether other cultural issues or resource protection or national security, and you would need a partner to actually work with in the market. And then the third list um, is a list basically based on competitiveness but you're not really precluded in most of these. Every one of these types of, of business segments are things that foreigners are working in, they are doing business in, and there are structures that allow you to do that. So while that looks pretty daunting, it can be navigated pretty uh, efficiently. There are um, some exceptions to it. I'm not gonna read through these, but uh, certain levels of investment. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the board of investment is very, very, pro-foreign business. Um, you've heard about selecting your partners. Um, I think that the thing to talk about for this is, you know, direct sales, you can export, you can do it alone. It's hard to grow the business uh, using an e-commerce e platform. Uh, the e-commerce the e platform, Shopee, Lazada, Amazon are all here. Um, they're relatively uh, easy to, to deal with. Um, and they're growing very, very rapidly. Uh, channel partners, agents, or distributors, a very accomplished group of um, you know, potential partners for that. And again, um, sophisticated business people, so you can find the right partners. Uh, and then setting up here, uh, despite the Foreign Business Act uh, restrictions, uh, is relatively um, painless, and you can get set up if you wanted to uh, have an in-country presence. Um, looking at the cultural comparisons, um, 
you know, similar to some of the countries that Uday just talked about, the, you know, the power dynamic of decision making versus consensus, it's top down decision making here. Um, the, the next one, individualism, um, you know, I actually think that this is rated incorrectly. Ties are, are entrepreneurs, uh, they're individual. I think that this comes from the, um, the fact uh, that they are in this constitutional monarchy. Uh, but ties are free thinkers. And so um, there was a, uh, a survey done by one of the leading advertising firms. I think it was Ogilvy and Mather. And 78% of ties wanted to own their own business. And so getting back to working and finding somebody to represent you or trade, you, trade with you, um, that's pretty easy. Um, masculinity, it's a very open um, society for uh, gender and sexual orientation. It's very fluid. Um, Uncertainty avoidance, one of the things that's really important uh, about ties is they avoid conflict. They don't want conflict at all. Um, they, uh, they will <laughs> avoid it at, at any chance and that can make things sometimes hard to do business, but there are ways to, to deal with that. Uh, they're not that long-term and oriented um, compared to other places, but similar to Canada um, and, and not very indulgent. Um, Uday's covered the base market checklist. I'm gonna skip that and I'm gonna go right into the Philippines with time uh, considerations. Philippines has really struggled in the beginning of COVID. Uh, and it wasn't until just recently um, that they've gotten a handle on it. So the, the economy was really decimated. Uh, and I, it, it's just probably in the last couple months where you're seeing free uh, movement uh, in the country, and uh, and uh, you know a forecast recovery, which is good. Um, again, comparing Thailand in the in the Philippines, excuse me, from an industry perspective, uh, services uh, really dominate. It's not a manufacturing hub. Um, you know there there is of course uh, you know some manufacturing, some electronics there, uh, some mining. Shipbuilding is is one of the stronger ones. And in addition to that, there has been some relocation of uh, mainly North American investors um, in China that were hit by the, uh, the US-China trade tariffs uh, and have uh, relocated to the Philippines. Uh, there's a good technical supply of workers. English is the national language. Uh, and that's what really propels the business process outsourcing in the, in the back office shared services. Uh, tourism is, is also a major portion of this, um, but they're not dependent on tourism like a, like a Thailand is. Um, I think one of the, the interesting things is that we all, we all probably know in our, in our home uh, province uh, that, uh, you know, Filipinos that are working there. Um, one of the largest exports of the Philippines is its people. And it's sort of best and brightest have been uh, working overseas and repatriating money um, to their families to take care of them. And they've been doing that for, for decades. What is interesting now is that many of the people that have been doing that, you know, in all cor corners of the globe um, have made money. They've been working in, in Western economies and they've saved a lot and they're going back. They're going back to the Philippines and they're becoming entrepreneurial uh, in, in their outlook. They're setting up small shops and restaurants and outlets and they're importing goods. Uh, and this is really a new phenomenon. And it's something that, uh, you know, hasn't happened until about the last 10 years um, and even more so in the last five years. And uh, another thing about the Philippines economy uh, that I, I said earlier, you know, Thailand sort of took off and grew. Thailand's about 200 billion larger in, in GDP. Um, the Philippines didn't invest in its infrastructure uh, and, you know, I mentioned that they were equal when I first started my career here in terms of the size of the economy and what happened, but the Thais had a, a group of technocrats that went and really put in a, a plan for the growth. Uh, and that was supported by the large families that, uh, that dominate business. In the Philippines, the large families that dominate the business um, didn't really work in collaboration with the government to build some of that infrastructure. They of course collaborated with the government to make money, um, but they haven't built some of the infrastructure that they need. And it's particularly daunting from a road perspective 
uh, is the Philippines, of course, is, is a group of islands and arch archipelago and uh, going across each of those islands can be really difficult and, and then going from one to the other, uh, they just don't have the infrastructure to ship goods. Um, with all that said, uh, the forecasts are for uh, the Philippines to be quite strong in its GDP growth this year. It is being viewed in ASEAN as a alternative to uh, more developed uh, countries like Malaysia or Thailand. Um, the ease of business uh, due mainly to the corruption I commented about earlier um, is a, you know, a, a lot lower ranking uh, than some of uh, its other ASEAN neighbors but that's balanced a little bit by uh, the ability to do business in English. Um, the other thing is the, Philippine, the Filipinos themselves have a, a you know, very much a, a love of North American foods, North American culture. Uh, you know, they, are, they are very aligned with it um, and that makes it a, an easy place to work from that perspective. Um, the food processing sector is, is growing rapidly um, while the Philippines itself has not become sort of a breadbasket of the region. Uh, we are seeing much, many more processing uh, of, of foods and seafoods going on there, and I think that will continue. Um, again, I won't go through these in, in detail, but uh, I think if you look at the difference here, 67.5 billion uh, in goods exported, versus 115 billion uh, of net imports. So it's, it has been for a long time a net importer. Uh, it is forecast to continue to be a net importer, uh, which of course creates opportunities uh, for Canada. Um, and then when you look at it, uh, comparing Thailand and the Philippines, uh, Canadian exports are not that far beyond Thailand, a much bigger economy. Uh, most of that has been uh, driven uh, by the, the purchase of uh, Canadian uh, aerospace. Um, and so, you know, that those types of products with those high values will drive that, um, but will continue to be part of the economy as they build out that uh, infrastructure, both uh, for air, which of course is going to slow down a little bit, but um, some plans uh, potentially for, for trains, high-speed trains uh, that Canada could, uh, could also participate in. Um, looking at the... Uh, the sectors, uh, there are a number of negative uh, growth numbers here, but there are also more positive growth numbers um, in seafood, uh, in ores, uh, in mineral fuels uh, are showing growth and have continued to as exports from uh, Canada to the Philippines. So as Uday said, and I've echoed, you need to be careful. Um, you need to look at if the Philippines is a fit for your product. I think determining whether it's a fit for your product is the easier part. Determining who you wanna work with and getting the products in is the harder part. The, despite English, the, uh, the regulatory environment um, can be pretty daunting because of the, the corruption that uh, is there in the Philippines yet. Um, and so you really need assistance uh, on navigating this, whether that's your freight forwarders, whether it's your legal counsel, whether it's a consultant, uh, you, you, you need advice on this because there's a, a big potential risk of bringing products in and getting them hung up uh, when they come in. Uh, the partners, I talked earlier the, about the, the big families. There are about 10 major Philippine families that are very successful and have dominated the business. They're fantastic partners, uh, but they also have a lot of leverage when you're uh, doing, dealing with them because of their size and their scope of business. Um, historically, there haven't been a lot of mid-sized companies. Those are now starting to develop and there are a tremendous number of small entrepreneurs. Um, but the risk with the small entrepreneurs is do they have the financial wherewithal uh, to be able to, you know, to import and, uh, and uh, promote your goods uh, appropriately. Um, one of the things I mentioned earlier is this returning Philippine diaspora. Um, they are becoming an increasingly good choice for bringing products in and assisting you uh, to distribute in the Philippines. I don't think I'm gonna cover this. We've covered it in, in every uh, talk that we've had about the options on how to set up. Um, 
the Philippines, you can do all of the all of these, and uh, and you can get set up and do business. Uh, there are very few restrictions, uh, unlike Thailand, on what you can do. Um, it's much less, and so coming in and doing business here, uh, whether you set up your own entity or work with a partner, is very viable. The Philippines, the power dynamics. If if you if you think about this, this goes back to what I was talking about. Very few people making decisions. Very few uh, companies um, driving those decisions. Uh, individualism uh, is not that high. Uh, that's very accurate. Um, it's a it's a very uh, masculine machismo uh, society. The 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 Catholic uh, Spanish influence. Um, pervades that, uh, the culture. Um, very similar in terms of uncertainty and avoidance uh, with Canada. Um, very short-term oriented in their outlooks. A lot of that has to do with the, the lack of a really, really large uh, middle class. It's mostly lower class. Uh, and then uh, in, in indulgence um, is, is lower than Canada. Uh, this The picture on the, the bottom right is something called tinkling which is a national dance and they, they take bamboo and they, and they bang it together and you dance and it's competitive. And I, we highlighted that because one of the things is that the, uh, the Filipinos are competitive in their sports. They want to succeed at things and uh, showing that one of their major national dances is actually a competition, I think is, is a good description of, of how they think about uh, trying to compete uh, with uh, not only in a business sense, but uh, you know, just to get ahead. So, um, checklist two days covered that. I think it's probably a good time to open it up to questions. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, Uday. Um, so, Suzanne, back here. There are a few questions that have come in through the chat. So, I think what we'll do is we'll kick off with those. Um, and I've got a few of my own if we still have some time. Um, and so my good colleague, Daryl from PEI is curious. So what is the regulatory landscape like, if you know, um, specifically in the bio sector today in Indonesia? Do you have some insights there? I think in, in one word, uh, the best way to describe it is it's a bit gray. Um, there, you know, uh, the Indonesia Biosafety Commission is what really the organization that looks out at um, incoming biotech related, you know, whether it's GMO crops, uh, and other items. But uh, for the large part of this decade, uh, they were inactive for a while. I think while there was, um, you know, a change in the government and elections, which had slowed down some of their uh, reforms and new regulations that they wanted to come out with. So um, the best thing to do is keep an eye out on uh, what the Biosafety Commission is going to come out with in terms of their new regulations um, uh, regarding different products. Uh, also, another note, you know, uh, in terms of enforcement of certain laws, uh, it's lax in Indonesia. Um, I had not really touched upon this uh, in detail uh, during my, my session, but uh, you know, like in some of the other emerging markets here, corruption is an issue in Indonesia. Uh, slow moving reforms and decision making is an issue. And this all impacts um, you know, uh, the sectors like biotech where uh, you need proper enforcement of IP laws. You need um, you know, uh, the right kind of uh, reforms made to uh, remove certain protectionist measures uh, that uh, you know block um, biotech uh, products coming in, such as GMO crops, for example. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's that's you know the answer I can give at the moment. Uh, the best thing to do is keep an eye out on on what Indonesian the Indonesian government is doing from a from biosafety and biotech perspective. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Ida. Um, a couple of questions, John, regarding Thailand and the Philippines in particular. So. Um, are you aware in Thailand and or the Philippines of any um, major trade events that might be happening in the foreseeable future? Um, we've heard for some of the other markets that um, very small in-person events are, are being orchestrated, but a lot of it is still hybrid or, or virtual. But give us an indication if there's anything big coming up that we ought to be paying attention to or consider participating in. Yeah, so both of the countries have sort of backburnered all their events. And um, the, the Philippines has been very cautious about announcing anything uh, because it's taken them a long time to get COVID under control. Thailand 
was moving very quickly to look at how to liberalize until this last outbreak. And I think the Thailand has a number of trade events that are scheduled in the second half of the year that haven't been canceled yet. And um, the, they announced two days ago that starting July 1, uh, anyone who has been vaccinated will be able to come to the country. So I would expect that we will see trade shows probably not in the third quarter, but in the fourth quarter uh, coming back in Thailand. Okay. And, and part of that is it's, it's so, they're so dependent on, you know, tourism and, and I mean, the, the mice sector is, is huge here. And so, you know, bringing in exhibitions and, and trade shows is something that they, they're really focused on doing. They, you know, but they, they won't do it unless if, if they don't believe it's safe. Okay, that's great insight. And so we can pay attention to what's going on in, in Thailand with respect to some major international fairs. Um, about the Philippines, John, um, did you say that import licenses are required? Yeah, it depends on what you're bringing in. Um, I had a slide in there that people can look at it, but animal products, uh, your fishery aquatics, wood products, uh, minerals, they all need licenses. Uh, you know, anything on uh, food related has, has to have approval. Anything uh, medical, uh, drug related uh, needs to have approval, I know, a license. Yeah, good. And just to remind folks, we are posting all the presentations so people can view those at any time. And we're keeping the event platform open for, for conceivably several months. So good handy reference points to, um, to refer back to the decks. Um, so my colleague Max in Nova Scotia um, probably has the concluding question, the one that was going through my mind. Question to the two of you. With everything that we've learned this week, we've talked about, um, again, Japan and South Korea and Vietnam and Singapore, and now these four, um, mind you, spotlights on four other ASEAN countries. So let's rank them. Let's rank them in terms of opportunities for Atlantic Canadian SMEs who presumably will have a great quality niche product or service. Where do we go first? Where do we go second? And you know, where should we maybe backburn some of the other markets, if you will? Yeah, well, well, I'll, I'll start, uh, and then we'll see if Uday agrees. Um, <laughs> I, I think, uh, in terms of the developed markets for uh, the, the types of products that are are being produced in, in New Brunswick, um, you know, Singapore is a great starting point, and you know, the volumes are going to be smaller, but the sophistication of the market, the ability to spend on higher value products, is there. I think the next two, and I think they're very equal. Um, in terms of uh, buying power and being able to navigate, and it will really depend on what, you, what you're what you selling, uh, would be uh, Thailand and Malaysia. Uh, I think that those two offer, um, a, again, a, you know, a developed market that's used to bringing in higher value goods. Uh, I think the I think the emerging market of Vietnam that Dennis spoke about yesterday um, is one that's growing so quickly that, uh, you know, there's certainly some opportunities there. And I think that to me, the, the sleeper in ASEAN is the Philippines. Uh, and I think once they, um, they're started, they're growing faster in the last few years, uh, with the exception, of course, of the COVID uh, interruption than a lot of other places. So for ASEAN, that is, uh, that's how I would rank them. And Uday, what's your rank? Um, so I think uh, John is pretty much. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. I can, I can disagree with John a little bit now. Yes. Um, actually, I, I, I do uh, echo most of his ranking, uh, and it's a great question because this kind of ranking um, and analysis is what we do for a lot of our clients. And um, you know, uh, one one caveat I would add is, like John mentioned, it does depend on what you're bringing in, and what you want to export to this part of the world. Um, I would I would rank uh, in terms of um, uh, you know prioritization. The same thing the same way as john has the only thing is i would probably put indonesia as the um dark horse market uh, it's a challenging market but if you can crack it you've got a, a long-term market with a massive um you know market size of 270 million people 
So, um, so that would be, you know, I, I would say the dark horse entrant into the race uh, in that uh, in that ranking. And I would um, I would probably put that um, a bit higher than the Philippines. So it would go Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia, um, Indonesia for me, and then and then the Philippines at the end. But um, that's just my opinion. Your opinion yeah, it, matters. Thank you, John. I, I was just, I was just going to comment. I, I I think Uday's uh, the addition of Indonesia. It, if you have a consumer good and you can crack that market, um, you can do really, really well. Uh, but it is a hard one. And, um, you know, I, you know, we were specifically referencing ASEAN, but I, you know, I, I, I think you don't want to forget the markets that we talked about earlier in, in the week, uh, Japan and Korea. I mean, J Japan and Korea's uh, sophisticated economies with their purchasing power, um, you know, dwarf uh, the ASEAN countries for the most part. So, um, you know, I, you want to keep those in mind. Correct. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, and again, for spending Friday evening with us, your time. And Uday, again, a big special thanks for coordinating the week sessions um, for us with your team. John, we're delighted that you were able to join us as well. Um, so, so we'll finish off this morning's session with that. I know that there were more questions. And so probably what we'll do is we'll go through the questions and just kind of respond to folks by email. There's some pretty good questions. Um, anyway, it's hard to believe this is the end of our five day um, Asia Markets Forum. And we have learned so much from you and your team and, and from the seven trade commissioners also that, that joined us throughout the week. Just a reminder then, and I've already said, um, the platform stays open, the, the research, the sources of intelligence, the presentations, the bios of all of our speakers, we had 12 in total, they're all posted online with their um, information on how to connect with each of them directly. And I do encourage all of our guests to do that if they have some additional questions. Um, Finally, I would like to acknowledge um, fabulous support, stellar event management services offered by Sarah and her team at Host Event Management. Um, the dedication and efforts of my own team here at OMB behind the scenes, um, putting together the content and trying to develop a robust program for you. Um, and finally, the support of our colleagues across the region from Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, Prince Edward Island, Global Affairs, Canada, ACOA, um, without whom this forum certainly would not have been made possible. And we acknowledge our funding support under the Atlantic Trade Investment um, Growth Strategy. Alors, je vous souhaite une très bonne journée. Thank you again to everybody. Um, have a wonderful day, wonderful weekend, and please stay safe. Bye-bye for now. Thank you, Suzanne. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Suzanne. My pleasure.